Good morning, everybody, and welcome to an epi another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sophie, and I am an educator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Also behind the camera, I am joined by my friend Tina, who's going to be controlling all the cool stuff you see going on behind me. So we are located here in Long Beach in Southern California, and that's where we are coming to you live. So if you are watching with us right now, feel free to call or text us, and I'll have Tina put our number here down at the screen. If you have any questions or if you want to share anything through our, our program today, feel free to call and text at that number down there. It is 562-286-1838. Again, that is 562-286-1838. If you're watching at another time, like later on, feel free to email us at the email we have down here. It is live at lbaop.org, and that can be any sort of questions or anything you have that you want to share with us. You have a couple ways to contact us if you want to let us know about anything that's going on. So today we are going to be talking about a very cool animal, several of which we have here at the aquarium. But one of the things that we're going to do first is we are going to practice being scientists. Now, Tina and I are both scientists, and that may sound a little surprising to you because we may not look like scientists. We may not be older. We may not have those fancy white lab coats that some scientists have, but that's because all scientists will look a little bit different, and everyone can be a scientist just the way they are. One of the things that scientists do a lot is they make observations. Observations is just a very fancy word for looking at something that you see in front of you and describing what you are seeing. So example, if I wanted to make an observation, I would say that I have Tina sitting in front of me and I can see that Tina is wearing a navy polo just like I am. So that's a very good observation. So now what I'm gonna have all of you do for just a couple of moments is I'm gonna have you look at what you see going on behind me. This is one of our live webcams from here at the aquarium. And I want you to take a couple of moments to make some observations for yourself. So let me go ahead and step off screen and make some of those observations. If there's anything that kind of catches your eye, any colors that you notice, or any shapes, or even movement, making observations is a very good way to learn a little bit more about the world around us, and then we can also start to notice patterns from there too. So take a couple more moments, see what you notice, if anything stands out to you. Now, like I said, if you want to go ahead and text us or call us about your observations, that number is 562-286-1838. And we got Tina monitoring that line too. So if there's anything you want to talk about, go ahead and let us know. So now that everyone has had a couple of moments, think about some of those observations that you see, or maybe share some of those observations. I know when I first look at this exhibit, one of the things that I notice right away is there's a lot of kind of green plant-like looking material. Now, for those of you that are familiar with that really plant-like material you see, you'll know that that is a type of algae called kelp. Some of the other things that you may notice or some other observations you may have is there are some pretty big, very slow moving fish in this exhibit. Those are some of our giant sea bass. As the name suggests, they can grow up to 500 pounds. Sometimes they can get upwards of five to seven feet long and they do move very, very slowly. So they're sort of like gentle giants. So this is a webcam from our blue cavern exhibit. It's looking at a kelp forest, some of the ecosystems that we get locally here in Southern California. And although we're not gonna be focusing on these ecosystems today, we are just kind of practicing our observation making so that when we get into the animal we are talking about today, we're already all warmed up with our scientist brains and those observations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and step off and I'm gonna have Tina put on one of the animals that we are gonna be talking about today. When she puts on the animals, I'll have you make a little bit of observations about what you're seeing. Maybe compare and contrast what the fish looked like versus these ones. But just take a couple of moments to make some observations. These animals may look a little bit different than some of the fish we were just looking at. So that may be a clue as to what we're going to be talking about today. Now I know when I look at this, one of the things that I notice right away are definitely the colors on these animals. I see a lot of black on the backs of them, some kind of white in the front and on their faces. They also have a little bit of orange and yellow at the front of their face. One of the other things that helps me figure out what kind of animal this is, is I see a lot of feathers on them. When we think about animals in the ocean that have feathers, 
we can't really think of any that come to mind. Especially when we're thinking about fish. They don't really have feathers, they have scales. But today, the reason why we're looking at feathers is because we are going to be talking about different types of birds. And you may be wondering to yourself, well, why is an aquarium talking about birds? Don't they usually talk about ocean animals? Well, there are some birds that like to live in the ocean. They either live on top and they like to find their food towards the bottom of the ocean. And these types of birds, a lot of them are called diving birds. They will also have some special adaptations or some special tools that help them out, especially since they tend to spend more time in the water than maybe other birds that you may find on land. These ones that we're looking at right here in particular are called puffins. Puffins are a really cute type of diving bird that we have here at the aquarium. As you can take a look at them, you see all those different colors on them. They have those really nice black feathers towards the back. They have some white feathers towards the front, towards that chest area of their body. And then if we move up a little bit closer towards their head, you'll see their head has a really nice kind of white color right here to it. And then if you look a little bit further at the beak, you'll see that it has some nice orange and some nice yellow to it as well. Like I said, these birds will be a little bit different than some of the birds that you may find on land. But first, let's kind of go over a general overview about what it means to be a bird. So we as humans are mammals. So that means there are certain things that are specific to us as mammals. Can anyone think of what it means to be a mammal? What are some of the things, some of the characteristics that make up a mammal? What is different than maybe us from a fish? Those are some good ways of thinking about what it means to be a mammal. Some of the things about being a mammal include being warm-blooded. So that means we keep ourselves nice and warm and our bodies inside of us constantly keeping ourselves nice and warm even though the outside that we're in may be super cold. Now another thing about being a mammal that's going to be a lot different than fish and a lot different than birds is that we give live birth. So that means that when we were born, we didn't hatch from eggs. We were born live and we were able to breathe immediately once we were born. Now fish and birds will also be a little bit different. Some fish lay eggs and some fish may have something a little bit different. They may have live birth if you're a shark or if you're a ray or something like that. Now with birds, these animals will lay eggs. So that means that when they give birth to the egg, the baby isn't breathing right away. It's not moving around on its own. Instead, it's encased in a nice little protective egg and then it's up to the parents, either the mom or dad or sometimes both, to protect and incubate that egg until it's ready to hatch. And that's when it becomes a live baby, when it's moving and breathing a little bit more. So that's something that birds will have in common is that they will all have that egg laying ability. They're not gonna give live birth. And something else that a lot of birds have is they have those feathers and those wings, which means they are very, very good at flying. Now, does anyone out there wish they could fly? I know sometimes I wish I could, and I know that's something we all talk about a lot too, especially those hypotheticals about if you had a superpower, what would your superpower be? Well, a lot of us would choose flying. For these birds, they already have that built-in superpower. They're able to fly. So that means they'll spend a lot of their time in maybe higher places like tree branches. They may also be able to find a different things in the air to eat, like maybe different types of bugs. If they're a larger bird of prey, like maybe some sort of raptor or some sort of eagle, they may also be consuming some of those smaller birds. So that means that where they find their food will be a little bit different. One of the reasons why birds are such excellent flyers and one of the reasons why we as humans can't really fly is because we have a very nice skeletal structure. We have all these bones in our body that keeps us upright, keeps us moving around. The reason why I'm able to move my hands around so much is because I have all these bones in my hands and my arms and my fingers to help me move around. Birds have all those too. The reason why birds are able to fly and we are not able to is because birds, for the most part, have hollow bones. So when ours are full and very heavy, birds will be hollow and a little bit lighter. So that means that when they're flying through the air, they may not weigh as much as maybe a human. It also means that having those hollow bones is going to allow them to fly a little bit more. When we're talking about different types of diving birds or seabirds, some of them are able to fly. It kind of depends on the species, kind of depends on the animal, but most seabirds or diving birds are able to fly a little bit. Some of the differences between those birds that we see on land a lot more versus these diving birds or these seabirds 
is that their bones may not be as hollow as those ones on land or that hang out in the air. A lot of seabirds will have those hollow bones, but they may be a little bit denser, and that means it's going to help them out a lot more when they are swimming in the water. Now, puffins are a particular type of diving bird, and they can actually swim very well, too. One of the other ones that we'll be talking about today are penguins. I'll tell you a little bit more about them, but they may not be the best swimmers. When we're talking about puffins, there are about four different species of puffins. Oh, and Tina got us a really good look at our puffin exhibit here at the aquarium. So when puffins aren't swimming around or diving for their food, we'll see most of them hanging out on the surface or in those kind of rocky areas. That's where you'll be. And like I said, there are about four different species, and you can typically find them in northern parts of different types of oceans. When they're not hanging out on the water or in the rocky area, they like to find their food. Now, because a lot of these animals, because we call them diving birds or we call them sea birds, where do you think they'll be getting their food from? Well, if they spend a lot of time on the surface of the water, they're probably going to be diving deep to look for their food. So that means the diet of most of these diving birds will consist of some sort of fish or some sort of seafood. For our puffins, these animals really like to eat herring, which is a small little schooling fish. Puffins are really cool because these animals can dive about 200 feet. So that's farther than some other types of animals can dive, depending on how you are as a human or what your levels are in the water. That's probably deeper than we can scuba dive too. But puffins are able to dive 200 feet down to find their food. And that's good because then it means they get to eat all those different types of schooling fish, or also they get to eat little pieces of krill, which we see Tina showing us here in this picture. Now, if we think about fish, we know that fish are kind of fast, kind of slippery. So how are puffins and other diving birds able to catch these really fast, these very slippery animals? Well, one of the ways that they're able to do it is because of that really unique beak they have or that kind of mouth on the front of them. Different types of diving birds will have beaks that are usually kind of pointy. Sometimes they may have not necessarily spikes, but they may be maybe a little serrated. We got a good picture of that right there. We can see a really nice penguin beak. So you'll see that it stretches out very well. It stretches out really far and then kind of forms almost like a V right here at the end of it. So because of that, and because they have those little serrations, that means they're able to catch those fast and those slippery food items that they like to eat. Now for puffins, even though it looks like they have pretty small mouths, they can actually catch an incredible amount of fish at a time. I think if I were to go grab a handful of herring, I could maybe grab like five, maybe six. What do you think, what do you, think you could grab, Tina, with a handful, maybe like Okay, Tina says she can probably grab three with them. I say maybe like five or six, I may be overestimating. But when puffins go down to grab food, they can grab 10 to 12 herring at a single time. So using that mouth that they have, that beak, they can go and grab up to 12 fish all at once. Now that's really impressive, especially for these animals that also breathe air like we do. When they're diving down, they wanna be able to maximize that time. They want to be able to get the most amount of fish while they're holding their breath in that short amount of time so that they don't have to take a whole bunch of multiple trips. So being able to grab up to 12 fish at once is super advantageous and super helpful for these animals. One of the ways that they're able to catch those fish without making sure they lose them is they also usually have kind of spikes in their throat. I know penguins will have something like that. Turtles usually have something like that as well. But they usually have little kind of soft things in their throat that help them catch those fish a little bit more and also help make sure that when they're slurping down the fish, they don't choke or end up accidentally spitting up their food at all. Now, I did mention that these puffins do like to dive down to the bottom of different ocean environments to find their food. But what's really unique about puffins is that these animals can also flap their wings very, very fast. Puffins can flap their wings about 400 times per minute. That is incredibly fast. That also means that when they are flying around in the air, sometimes they can fly up to 55 miles per hour. So not only do they dive very deep around 200 feet to find their food, puffins, since they live on kind of cliff areas that are near shores, they can also fly an incredible amount. So we're getting a really good look at that nice big wingspan on a puffin. 
again, these animals are actually kind of small too. Um, they usually don't get too big, maybe about like this is a good kind of guesstimate for a puffin or at least the puffins we have here at the aquarium. So that wingspan isn't too large in terms of size compared to me, but for that animal it is. And it really helps them out because they're able to die very well and also fly to get some of, to some of those places that these animals like to live in. Now puffins are just one of the animals that we have here at the aquarium, but we also have some other animals that are typically a little bit of a fan favorite. And those are some of our Magellanic penguins. Oh, we got a really good look at that penguin right now too. So Magellanic penguins can be found in South America. All the different species of penguins that exist, there are about 18 different species. They can all be found in the Southern Hemisphere. So that means these regions down here that are south of the equator. Magellanic penguins in particular will be found along the coast of South America, so kind of over here in this area. Now when you think about areas in South America, I usually think of really nice beachy areas, maybe like tropical areas or jungly rainforests. I don't really think about snow too much in South America. Maybe at like the furthermost point down here, but I don't think about snow along the edges, especially in these beachy areas. And that's actually the perfect environment for Magellanic penguins to live in. A lot of the times when guests come to the aquarium or when we think about where penguins live in their natural habitat, we assume that all penguins like to hang out in snow or those really icy areas. Magellanic penguins though, they actually don't ever see ice or snow. They live along those kind of rocky coastlines of South America, using those rocks and other hard items to build nests, but these penguins actually don't even need any snow at all in order to survive. Instead, they're used to that kind of temperate temperature, which we also get here in Southern California, which is why we have a really nice population of penguins here at the aquarium. Now, right now what we're seeing is it looks like a much larger kind of colony or gathering of these animals on the beach. Most birds, or especially when we talk about penguins altogether, when we have a group of them that like to live together, we call those a colony. So it looks like we got a nice colony right there. Now what's also really cool about Magellanic penguins is that these animals are usually on the, usually on the smaller side. When they get up to human height, they get up to like maybe your knee, maybe a little bit taller, like halfway up your leg, but they are on the smaller side. There are some other types of penguins that exist that can get very, very big. I think it's the emperor penguin, for example, that can get maybe like four feet tall, and that's pretty big for a penguin. If you're walking around Antarctica somewhere or in that southern hemisphere and you see a penguin that comes up to like here on you, that would definitely be something really unique to see. But our Magellanic penguins are on the smaller side. Now, similar to our puffins, our Magellanic penguins are also a species of animal that like to hang out on the surface of the water or right by the shoreline. Now these penguins, just like puffins, will also eat different types of seafood. They like to eat herring and capelin, some of those small schooling fish that puffins like to eat, but they also like to eat different types of squid. Now with our penguins here at the aquarium and with our puffins as well, all these animals will get different kinds of restaurant quality sustainable seafood. So if we were to go to a nice seafood restaurant right now and order something like shrimp or squid, we'd be getting the same quality of food that our penguins and puffins get fed here at the aquarium. Now what's also really is just like how different people or different animals at home may have food preferences, some of our penguins also have food preferences too. So that means some of them may like different types of fish a little bit more. Some of them may like squid more than some of the other penguins, or also some of them may be very picky eaters. So that's something that's very funny about the diet of a lot of animals here at the aquarium. Now something that we were able to notice on our puffins and something that we can also see here on our penguins is we've talked about their beak a little bit, but let's also take a look at their feet. What do those feet look like? They may look similar to the puffins, they may look different than some other animals we've seen on land, but those feet on the animals, especially for these diving birds, a lot of them are gonna be webbed. And that's important because having those webbed feet means you can use them kind of like paddles when you're swimming around in the water. If I have my hand just like this and I'm swimming around, when I push through water, I'm not gonna be able to push through much because in between here and my fingers, there's not really any space or there's a bunch of open space. So that means water's just gonna rush through. 
Now, if my hands are together like this, almost like a webbed penguin or puffin foot, when I push through the water, I have more surface area across this whole thing. So that means I can push through the water and swim a little bit better. So that's why having webbed feet for the puffins and the penguins is super helpful. They can use them as paddles. They can also swim in the water a little bit more. Now, I mentioned that puffins are super, super good flyers and swimmers. When it comes to our penguins, on the other hand, they're only good at one of those activities, and the one that they're good at is swimming. They can swim, they can dive very well, but when it comes to flying, most penguin species don't really fly. And one of the reasons that is, is if we take a look at what their body looks like, especially those wings, we'll see that they look a lot different than the puffin wings did. When the puffins outstretch their arms, we got really nice feathers all underneath here, which means perfect for flying. But if we take a look at our penguins, you'll see that those feathers aren't really as apparent. Their arms are a lot skinnier. They look a lot like human arms. So that means these animals won't be able to fly as well. But when they're moving around in the water, oh, those front wings, those kind of flipper looking things are going to come in handy very, very well. They're going to use those almost like a sea lion to push themselves through the water. And that's how they're going to be getting most of their momentum. So although penguins may not be able to fly very well on land, when they're moving in the water, it almost looks like they're flying. And we got a really good look at that one mid-action shot right there, too. Kind of looking down at us. That's kind of what a prey item would look like as it's looking up at the penguin or as the penguin's looking down in order to find their food. But even though these animals don't swim or don't move the best, in the air, on land, they move incredibly well in the water. Now, something else that's very funny about penguins, too, is that their body and their skeletal build is a little bit different than ours. What I mean by that is they have their knees kind of up in their body. So we have our hips and then our legs go down to our knees, but our penguins' knees are kind of tucked up in their body, almost like if you tuck yourself up into a, bo into a ball. So if you've ever seen a penguin walking around on land, you'll notice that it may look a little silly. They kind of walk just like this, taking their time. And that's because their body is different. Their knees are going to be up inside of their body. One of the other things that's very cool about penguins and that I mentioned earlier about the puffins is that these animals do lay eggs. Once these animals lay their eggs, usually it's time for a mother or a father penguin or puffin to sit on those eggs. So what happens is when they hatch is the penguin will quite literally just kind of stand on it, maybe sit a little bit, just keeping it nice and warm. Here we have a picture of what it looks like when one of our penguins is sitting on the egg. One of the other pictures you can see is it looks like one of our animal care staff is holding onto it with their gloved hands. But in that top picture, you may see a light and it may look a little bit strange to you. But one of the reasons why we hold up a light to our eggs, especially some of our penguin ones, is because we want to check on the development and the growth of that penguin chick or that penguin embryo inside of the egg. Sometimes penguin parents may not be the best parents the first time around, but we do want to make sure that that baby survives and that we have a young puff or a young chick when it hatches. So what we do here at the aquarium is we can incubate our eggs. That means we can put them in kind of a little warm, almost box to help replicate the feeling of the warmth of a mother or father penguin sitting on the egg. But one of the other things we can do is we can check it with technology like this, holding it up to a flashlight or holding it up to some sort of light to check on the development and to make sure that that baby is doing okay. And also, if it needs any extra help or any more special attention, then we can take note of that from there. So that's something that we do here at the aquarium is that we will take a lot of our penguin eggs, we'll check on them to make sure they're doing okay, and then we can put them in one of our incubators or we can allow the parents to kind of sit on it and see how it's going to go from there. The reason why talking about these penguin eggs is important for us here at the aquarium is because the Magellanic penguins are part of a much bigger program called a species survival plan. That means that here at the Aquarium of the Pacific or any other zoo or aquarium that has Magellanic penguins, we are, our, we are all a part of a network of people that work together and talk to each other in order to better help these animals. One of the things that we can do as part of the species survival plan is we may move penguins to different facilities. 
we may move different Magellanic penguins around or bring new ones in here in order to better our population or to better our colony of penguins. When we say there's part of a species survival plan, that means that every single Magellanic penguin in a zoo or an aquarium is monitored, it's tracked, and also we're able to trace all of its family tree or all of its genetics. So that means that we, if we have certain penguins here at the aquarium, just by looking up who it is in the species survival plan, we're able to figure out who its parents are. We're able to know who it's related to. Does it have brothers? Does it have sisters? Does it have relatives at a different aquarium? And that also helps us make sure that when we're moving different penguins around, we're not mixing too many and we're spreading them all out very, very well. When you're looking at penguins, sometimes they may all kind of look the same, especially for our uh, husbandry staff that works with them very well. That's when they're able to know who's who. But if myself or Tina were to go up to our exhibit and look at the penguins, I may not be able to know who's who right away. One of the things that we're able to do is we will give them little kind of bracelets on their arms to help identify them. So as you're looking at the picture right here, if you take a look at that picture a little bit further, you can see that nice little bead band right there. We can see that it has a white, a black, and then a red bead on it. So then we'll have a corresponding name with who's who. I'm not sure which penguin that is. But once we look at that specific color marking, that's when we're able to know who the penguin is. And not just here at the aquarium, but across all zoos and aquariums that have those Magellanic penguins. Whenever we see those co different colors, we're able to know who, who. And again, we're able to figure out who's related to them, who their parents are, and then if siblings as well. It's important just to make sure that when we're talking about helping these animals and making sure we have really healthy populations of them, we want to make sure that we are keeping them either together or separate depending on if they have siblings or different adults. And again, this is just going to better uh, benefit the bigger population as a whole to make sure that all those Magellanic penguins living down in South America are also doing well and also ensures that we can learn a little bit about our Magellanic penguins here to better help those out in their natural habitat. So those are just a handful of the diving birds that we have here at the aquarium. We have some of our puffins. We also have some of our Magellanic penguins. And then we also have lorikeets. Now, lorikeets aren't necessarily a diving bird. They're a small sort of almost parrot looking animal that likes to live in tropical areas. They're native to the Australia, the Papua New Guinea, and the New Zealand region. So here we got a good picture of all the different colors on those lorikeets. And although these ones aren't necessarily diving birds, they do live in a lot of those tropical that may overlap with some of those ocean environments that we are talking about. These ones are super colorful, blend in with all those tropical areas very well. And these birds are excellent, excellent flyers. They like to eat nectar, so the st stuff that you can find inside of plants. And in order to do that, they have a very specialized tongue. They have a tongue that looks almost like the edges of a brush that allow them to get up that, to get that nice liquid nectar that they like to eat. All birds will be a little bit different, especially if we're thinking about diving birds. The puffins and the penguins were different than the lorikeets. And also the puffins and the penguins will be different from themselves, even though they are diving birds already. So those are just a couple of the animals, a couple of the birds that we have here at the aquarium. But as we learned today, all of these animals are connected. Even if our lorikeets live in tropical places, they're still overlap with those tropical ocean environments that they live in. For a lot of our diving birds, we see those animals living on the surface of the water and eating a lot of those fish that like to live inside of the water. So that's how we see them interconnected with the ocean and that's how everything is related. So if you're watching this at a later time or if there's anything else you want to go ahead and share with us, like we mentioned earlier at the beginning, you are more than welcome to text, call, or email us. One last time, our number is 562-286-1838, and that email is live at lbaop.org. But I do want to thank you all so much for joining us, for learning a little bit about some of the birds we have here at the aquarium. We hope to see you next week, and I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.